graceandtruthradio.world proudly presents Life Coaching for Men, improving their relationships with their wives and learning to communicate for a more fulfilling and satisfying marriage. And now, Men Loving Well with Christian counselor, author, and relationship coach, Dr. Jim Slaughter. Welcome, everyone. You know, it's one thing to love your wife well when she's being kind and sweet to you and things are going well. But what about when things aren't going so well and your wife seems inconsiderate or when she makes mistakes, maybe, that add to your load as a husband? This is the situation that Peter brings up in his instructions to husbands in 1 Peter 3.7. You have been teaching and preaching, and you did your dissertation on Peter's instructions to husbands. Why have I never, ever heard that in any church, anywhere? I always hear about Paul. Yeah, you sure do. In fact, uh, um, when you go to a wedding, uh, for the most part, uh, when the scriptures are read and the vows are being made. We're reading from Ephesians 5, Paul's instructions to husbands and wives about submitting and loving. And and those are extremely important parts of the marriage relationship, of course. And and of, of Paul's words, we also hear from Genesis about Genesis 2 sometimes um, um, being one flesh together in the marriage mm-hmm. relationship. Um, Peter's words are and just as important as what Paul has to say, of course, he was an apostle along with Paul. Um, but his words to husbands are very brief. They're only one sentence, one verse. First Peter 3, 7 is Peter's instructions to husbands. So part of it is the fact that Paul extends his uh, discourse a little bit. He has more to say, um, although Peter has a lot to say in that one short verse that he has. Part of the problem is that uh, Peter is, uh, in this verse, difficult to understand. That verse is, uh, it, it's difficult to interpret. If you interpret it the way many people do today, you come out with a meaning that I believe Peter never intended to give. And so it's a minefield of interpretational problems. It's one of the reasons I chose it to do my work and my doctoral uh, dissertation because nobody dealt with Peter. Everybody dealt with Paul, and and I wanted to do something that nobody else was thinking about or had given much thought to. I looked over every commentary on First Peter that had been written over the last hundred years before I wrote my dissertation to see what people were saying about that. And guess what? Hardly anybody said anything. Wow. And so there was this huge gap where Peter was in uh, the letters of the New Testament. And when it came to marriage exposition, uh, ma- uh, instructions about marriage, uh, th- there was virtually nothing there from Peter. And I thought, this is an important work because Peter shouldn't be left out. You know, we've, we've kind of referred to it, you and I jokingly, as uh the, the the hidden letter of Peter or something, the hidden instructions to husbands um, that Peter gives or the missing link in um, uh, marriage instructions, that kind of thing. Rarely it's, ever mentioned. Yeah, very rarely mentioned. And so um, that's one of the reasons it, it, Peter is difficult to understand. Uh, his grammar is different from Paul. Um, um, by the way, Peter knew Paul's writings and he refers to Paul a couple of times in his own his own letters. And he uh, makes the, the statement that Paul's letters are hard to understand <laughs> like the rest of the scriptures. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I find that true myself. I think Paul is uh, sometimes hard to understand, uh, but for different reasons from Peter. And so I wanted to dig into First Peter and see what I could find out about his instruction to husbands. Oh, my goodness, what I found was incredible and almost no one else addressed the issue. Part of it has to do because of the way that we need to translate that passage and uh and the implications of of a of a translation when it comes to uh, to really doing the hard work of that. Now, tell us the uniqueness of Peter's message. Thank you for asking that question, or to to, to ask me uh, to do that. Yeah, to read Peter is not to read Paul. To read Paul is not to read Peter. Peter comes at marriage and especially the husband's responsibility, both actually, but in the, in our case here, as we're talking, the husband's responsibility from a very different perspective from what Paul uh, does. Peter's message has to do with mutual deference 
actually, between the husband and the wife, rendering honor to one another in a, a, an attitude and a spirit and a behavior of mutual deference. This is something that very few commentators bring out, and there are numerous reasons for that, but part of it has to do with the difficulty in translating that passage in First Peter. Another is a difficulty in understanding what he means once you get it translated. And so... Um, very few people deal with First Peter, and they kind of, I think it, he's written off in a lot of ways. But to me, he's extremely important, and especially because he brings out this particular nuance of, of meaning and implication for husbands who are Christians. And um, that nuance has to do with rendering this mutual deference, uh, which is honor and respect and esteem and those kinds of things, even in a, a kind of reverence if it comes to our our wives and uh that in the in the context of hardship, which is the context of his overall letter, the whole letter of First Peter controls every paragraph of his letter throughout all chap all the chapters. Peter's writing to Christians who are scattered throughout Asia Minor and uh, Roman provinces, and they are considered a, a very low class of people. They aren't citizens. They have no benefits that a citizen would. They're considered more. In fact, Peter calls them resident aliens and visiting strangers. They're like legal aliens in in our country today, except they had no benefits at all back then. They had no benefits and they were required many, many hardship, hard responsibilities by the Roman government. And so it would be just the most natural thing for people to be so resentful of the Roman Empire and the people who are over them in that situation. They would be, they would tend to be resentful. Their, their egos would cry out for uh, justice in, in a situation like that. Uh, they could easily become uh, hostile in their behavior and in their attitudes towards the government and even to the people around them. So it's that situation that Peter is addressing. And what he is telling them is that in a situation like that, in the difficult situation that they find themselves in, the hardship that they face, that they are to take on the attitude of Christ as he went to the cross without complaint uh, he suffered without complaint. Peter reminds his readers of the example of Christ. Christ suffered for you, he says, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. At this point, he inserts an Old Testament passage, Isaiah 53, 9. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he uttered no threats. That's the spirit that we are to exercise and that Peter was writing uh, to these people in uh, Asia Minor about in their hardship under the Roman Empire. Another passage follows from Psalm 34. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It is that kind of an attitude that these Christians uh, are to maintain, because in doing that, they reflect the spirit of Christ. They carry his name well. They are like him, and they will have an impact in this non-Christian, actually very degraded culture that they find themselves in. And so the, the main idea of Peter's first letter is this. The behavior of believers, when they are treated unfairly, reflects a spirit of deference in all relationships as they follow Christ's example and anticipate future glory. That is the exact message of First Peter. The whole thing has to do with deference in the face of hardship and unfairness. And so when we come to the passage about husbands, we should expect that Peter has that in mind as well for husbands. What he's telling husbands, and the way he puts it is, is this. He says, husbands, in the same way, just like those people who are, who are honoring and respecting those who are treating them unfairly, husbands, just like them, husbands, in the same way, live together with your wives in your knowledge of what the Scriptures teach. I put it this way. Husbands, in the same way, follow biblical principles as you live together with your wives honoring the more delicate feminine partner as heirs together with you. 
of the gracious gift of eternal life so that your prayers won't be hindered. So Peter urges a mutuality of giving and respect. And it's not just of a wife to husband, but uh, it's also of a husband to the wife. Peter implies that the same spirit which makes the wife gentle and non-argumentative should make the husband kind and attentive. The apostle emphasizes the reciprocal responsibilities of husbands and wives, regardless of the performance of the other. I like the way John Piper introduces the idea of a husband's call to benevolence towards his wife. This is what he says. Benevolent responsibility is meant to rule out all self-aggrandizing authoritarianism. It is meant to rule out all disdaining condescension and any act that makes a mature woman feel patronized rather than honored and prized. The word benevolent is meant to signal that mature masculinity gives appropriate expression to the golden rule in male-female relationships. There is to be, therefore, in Christian marriage, a mutuality of giving and receiving, a mutuality of nurturing, a mutuality of benevolence, and a reciprocity of the spirit of deference. I would add, do unto your wife as you would have your wife do unto you. Peter is saying that a Christian husband is responsible before God to behave like Christ behaved when things were hard for him. Christian husbands go through difficult times with wives who are really good wives, but they there are times when a husband may consider uh, the circumstances kind of unfair. Uh, his ego might want to rise up against that and cry out against that. But Christ is saying, Peter is saying, in the spirit of Christ, that he is to be acting towards his wife, behaving towards his wife with a spirit, which is Christ, which is a kindly spirit, a benevolent spirit, a spirit of reciprocity in deference, honoring her in everything, even though the going is tough and times are hard. When Peter says, follow biblical principles as you live together with your wife, well, that makes it clear that a man would have to know those biblical principles so he would have to read the Bible, right? Or at least listen to their pastor, <clears throat> which is why I wanted you to share about Peter, because that seems to be left out a lot. But definitely the guy would have to know these biblical principles, well, you know, and, and, and Peter is saying this. He's saying that, uh, it presupposes, you know, knowing what the Bible says before we can apply the principles in the way that Peter is calling us to apply them to honor our wives. The text actually says, um, husbands in the same way, live with your wives according to knowledge. The knowledge here is knowledge of the scriptures. It can't be knowledge of God. It can't be knowledge of our wives. It can't be sexual knowledge. It has to be knowledge of the scriptures. And so it presupposes that if a husband is going to follow what Peter says is important for him to do, that is to treat his wife uh, with deference, especially when things are difficult, he has to know the scriptures in the first place. And that means that a husband is going to need to read the word. He's going to have to read the scriptures on a regular basis and understand what they say so that he's able to apply them. That's what Peter's calling him to, to know the word of God and to apply its biblical principles in a way that uh, honors his wife and is a, a loving, caring, benevolent, deferential way to treat her. Some ways to do that are just picking up a Bible and a good translation that you like and that means something to you that you understand and read it on a regular basis. Look for principles to apply in your marriage. The book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, frankly, is just filled with principles that I need to follow if I'm going to plan to treat my wife with respect when she's being sort of hard to live with. I'd like to mention some of these for you uh, because they're so crucial. In the Old Testament, uh, the book of Proverbs for example, in Proverbs sixteen sixteen, good advice for a husband when uh, an argument looms. It says, a fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Proverbs twelve twenty two, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. Proverbs ten nineteen, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. And this is one of my favorites and one that, frankly, I need to, to think about a lot. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs fifteen twenty nine: a patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly. 
If you want to read about uh, sacrificial love, read the book of Hosea. Um, I think the majority of men that are hearing this m- might not know a lot about Hosea and what his story is like, but it's a story of sacrificial love. Read Hosea's story. If you want to know about God's view of married love, read Song of Songs. Sometimes that shows up as Song of Solomon in your Bible. Tender love is something that is displayed by the book of Ruth. So if that's something that appeals to you, read Ruth. Peter urges us to apply these principles, especially when marriage seems unfair. In the New Testament, we might turn to things like uh, Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, it says, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It just means that if there's anger in our relationship, if there's an argument that we have, we just need to settle it as quickly as possible. Reconcile as soon as possible so that anger doesn't creep into our, into our relationship. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Galatians 5, to 23 is kind of a summary of virtues that are useful to us as we're trying to apply Peter's principles in his own book here. But it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So Peter's telling us that when our marriage seems hard and, and my wife seems difficult, I need to apply principles like these. I, I don't need to be arguing or using harsh language to her or making demands of her, but thinking through these principles and applying them. In fact, where I want to be is getting to the place where it's the natural thing rather than the unnatural thing, where I don't have to think about it. It's just as a part of how I treat her and what I do with her. I don't want to be an argumentative, angry um, man. I want to be a loving, caring, understanding man. This transitions into Peter's next point. He says, honoring the more delicate feminine partner as heirs together with you of the gift of eternal life. Questions come up about what it means to honor our wives, especially when things aren't going well. But here's what honoring means. Honoring our wife means esteeming her. That is, uh, holding her in high regard, considering her of great worth and value as precious to us. We don't blame her or remind her of weaknesses, but we esteem her and hold her in high regard. Honoring means respecting her, considering her capable and competent, not inferior. She she has gifts and abilities of her own that make her the perfect wife for us. We should recognize that and consider that. Honoring means praising her, uh, encouraging her, and speaking well of her to others. We're not condescending, sarcastic, or cynical towards her, but we are kind and affirming. Honoring means celebrating her at times. Uh, That means holding her up to both private and public acclaim. We might sometimes create special occasions just for her as a part of our celebrating. So we honor our wives in the spirit of Christ who left us an example to follow. He committed no sin, Peter said, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he uttered no threats. I just would like to add some practical suggestions at this point, because some things come to mind to me that uh, really have to do with this. Realizing that all the things we've spoken of when it comes to honoring my wife, they have to do with things like, Realizing my ideas, for example, aren't always the best ideas. My wife has great ideas at times, and we have such different gifts. Some of them are the same, but many of them are very different. And I realize that she is incredibly capable of making good decisions, and her ideas are very creative, and she helps me when it comes to this. So, and instead of pushing my ideas through when it comes to a decision-making process, I've come to realize that it's important for me to listen to her and often do things her way. My ego has gotten in the way in the past so that there was a time when I thought it had to be done my way or it was going to be wrong. Now I realize that's 
incredibly selfish thinking and that it's not that way. And often I will defer to her in situations where we have different ideas about how to do something because often she's right and her ideas are best. It means not having to be in charge all the time. Honoring my wife means I don't have to be in charge all the time. Sometimes I want to uh, allow her to take over a particular situation. And there are different reasons for that. She uh, may know more about a situation. She may have had more experience with a situation. She may have studied this particular problem more in the past. And so there are times when I just would rather her be in charge because she knows better how to do something. A question comes up here, too, sometimes because I've discovered that often Christian husbands somehow feel compelled to take charge all the time, that somehow to them that means being a a good leader in the home and uh, the leader, the head of their wife and things like that. But I, I believe that's a misunderstanding of what the scriptures teach. I don't have to be in charge to lead well. I want to work with my wife as uh, members of a team to make sure that things are done in an orderly fashion and jobs are completed in a timely way and we get done what we need to do and that we're on the same team and that things are done in a godly way. So I don't have to always be in charge. And even if I'm not in charge, that doesn't mean I'm not a leader in my home. Leadership is something much more than that. Honoring my wife also means not saying things like, I told you so. If we had done it my way, uh, then this wouldn't have happened. Things would have turned out better. That's being very condescending. And this is something that I believe Peter is leading us against. And we've already addressed some of these issues. But practical considerations in everyday living really is what Peter's talking about. If we read the whole letter, we realize that he's talking to all classes of people, all kinds of people um, in different stations of life, but in everyday life together as they live with others. And the reason we're to do this, to honor our wives this way, is because we are both to inherit eternal life. Peter reminds Christian husbands that their wives have equal standing before God with them. Galatians 3.28 tells us, There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, Male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, heirs according to the promise. Not to honor my wife, not to treat her with respect and deference, as Peter calls me to do, would be to dishonor the salvation work that Christ has done for both of us. As if to put an exclamation point at the end of these instructions, Peter adds a warning. He says, so that your prayers won't be hindered. A Christian husband's attitude and behavior greatly affects his spiritual life. Here, specifically, his prayer life. A husband's behavior towards his wife directly affects his relationship to God. Sometimes we don't think about that. This truth reveals the seriousness, actually, of a husband's obedience to God's Word, especially as it pertains to the honorable treatment of his wife. See, not to treat her with honor as a fellow heir of God's grace, at the very least, impairs the marriage relationship to the extent that we can't pray together as a couple. Our prayer life is jeopardized. To a more grave extent, this kind of disobedience on a husband's part may constitute an offense to God, such that he may refuse to answer a husband's prayer, perhaps as a form of discipline. This direct relationship between a Christian's behavior And his relationship to God reveals the weightiness God attaches to Christ-like conduct on the part of his people, including the husband's treatment of his wife. So men, take the apostles' words to heart today. You may go home to a wife who's upset, who may be critical and unkind. Something's happened. Peter says to you, don't retaliate, don't lash out, but treat her with respect, with kindness, See her side of things and love her well by honoring her through your understanding of 1 Peter 3, 7. Thank you again for joining us. Men Loving Well airs live every Thursday at 1030 a.m. Central Time on graceandtruthradio.world. If you would like to contact or coach with Dr. Jim Slaughter, reach out to him on facebook.com living well show email him at jslaughterphd at yahoo.com 
or contact him at his clinic, Life Solutions, 817-232-1363. We look forward to seeing you again next week here on Men Loving Well. Life Solutions Coaching and Counseling in Fort Worth, Texas is a full-service wellness clinic providing individual, group, and family counseling, one-on-one coaching for life and wellness, and naturopathic treatments of medical massage therapy combined with essential oils to ensure you reach your health and wellness goals. Sessions are available in person or by phone. Get started on your new life today. Just call 817-232-1363 or go to LifeSolutionsCoachingAndCounseling.com or email them at LifeSolutions.com cc at yahoo.com